<laughs> just don't. Anyway, yeah, fortunately coming back when he was in the car, it moved along pretty well. Uh, for some reason, people don't drive from Denver to work in Colorado Springs. But I wanted to stress that his experience covering the broadest of issues in the Middle East is second to none. Uh, he has extensive experience as a journalist, as the editor of the Daily Star, working in academic settings, and right now he's in the States for a semester. I'm going to assume that wasn't aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> Army, I know about you guys. <laughs> um, and so we had the opportunity to bring him down here from Denver. And with that, I'm going to hand it over, and he can add anything more he wants to. Be open with him, ask whatever you want to. But before I hand it over, would you go around the room, introduce yourself. He doesn't need to know what squadron you're in, but who you are and what research topic you're working on. Um, I'm Cindy Lawless, and I'm working on just identities in the Middle East and uh, subnational identities and how they've kind of formed and became a part of uh, one question before you continue. Uh, is this a required course or, you, or you, they all chose no. to take it? They want to be here. <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> all right, thank you. Um, I'm Tori Yellow, um, and the topic I'm doing is women in Islam, especially sort of the difference between. Especially? Um, looking at the difference between um, their role in politics in uh, like Iran versus Saudi Arabia. So. <clears throat> Uh, Chad Turney, uh, and I'm researching the Houthi run <coughs> in Yemen and uh, just the factors that cause it to sort of uh, evolve in recent years, past four years. I'm uh, Sage Cunningham, and I'm looking at the commercialization, the urbanization of Mecca, and how that has had a role on the whole environment there. I'm James Cardinal, and I'm looking at the Arab League and what it's doing to combat Daesh. It's going to be a very short study. <laughs> <laughs> so what's that? Yeah. I'm Rebecca Bates, and I'm researching the Iranian nuclear deal from the Iranian perspective and why they want this deal in their country and why they're going forward with it. Just, um, just an editorial note. It's, it wasn't the Iranian nuclear deal. It was the deal on um, it was, uh, nuclear issues, and it was on sanctions. And it was a nuclear deal from the American perspective, or the P5 plus one. From the Iranian perspective, it was about removing the sanctions. So you have to that's make really sure fun. you get both sides of it, because that's what it was all. That's why it worked, because it addressed both. I'm May Fair, and I'm analyzing the psycho uh, psychology of different leaders in the Israeli Palestinian conflict and how that affects the conflict. Psychology of? Um, Israeli Palestinian leaders. Israeli both. And Palestinian leaders. Um, my name is Taylor Andres, and I'm researching um, the religious tolerance policies of the different platforms of like the Muslim Brotherhood, Egypt, and the Baal Party in Syria. Oh, wow. Um, I'm Jude Park Henry. Um, I'm researching like current border disputes in the Middle East and where they originate from. Um, and there's like a possible way to like, have my ideal world where they're all solved. <laughs> 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 I'm Brianna Winslow, and my topic is actually changed from what we previously discussed. So we should uh -oh. <laughs> but what I'm thinking about doing is uh, how like outside intervention affects the outcome of civil wars, and looking at the how that could affect the situation in Syria. I'm Faith Bradford, and I'm going to do a case study on the role of the Iraqi military and compare it to other. Militaries in the region. The role of them in Turkey or regionally or? Um, kind of both. Its role, its role in internal threats and external threats. Well, that's a pretty, uh, <coughs> pretty fine set of topics. You've, obviously, your interests range far and wide, and they're all very important in, in different ways. Um, uh, I'm happy to be with you. I'm really uh, always. In, uh, delighted to engage with people in the military, especially you know, people at the highest levels. So I've spoken at the Army War College, I've spoken at the NATO War College in Rome, where the food was better than it was at the Army War College. <laughs> <coughs> and, uh, and, and I interact with military people a lot, and I just have the highest respect for the, um, for the way that people in the U.S. military address, and look at issues. 
and, and I can tell from your topics that you know you, you have a seriousness, you have a caution, you have a you know a decisive, uh, assertive attitude as well, but tempered by caution and, and realism and accuracy, uh, because you're going to be the ones out there doing the fighting, and you can't just go and be involved in military action based on whims or rumors or or whatever or ideological fanaticism or whatever. So I've, I've just been super impressed by my interactions with military people, and I'm happy to have this chance to meet with young, uh, I guess, what's your, cadets? Officers cadets, or officers, cadets. Cadets is your title. So I'm delighted to have this opportunity. Um, and I'll just make a few quick comments. Uh, I should add that I'm not so impressed by the political leadership in the United States that tells the military what to do, because they often make bad decisions. But the military people themselves are, are just super in my view. And, uh, Tip my hat to you all and wish you the best. Uh, the best. Um, and I will always be happy to spend time in your careers. If you want to enjoy it, has my contacts. You can email me, call me, on, you can read my columns, whatever. I'd always be happy to provide any feedback uh, you want uh, if I can ever be of service to you. Um, the, uh, the issue, there's so many things going on in the Middle East. And, uh, they're all uh, turbulent, sometimes violent, uh, politically contentious. And the thing about the Middle East today, as opposed to 20, 30 years ago, I've been working as a journalist in the Middle East for 45 years. I graduated, from, I went to Syracuse University. And so if there's any Georgetown people who fans here, you have to leave the room. <laughs> basketball right. Did you graduate from the New House School? Yes. I went to Syracuse for a semester. Ah, really? Go yeah. orange. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, nice. For journalism? No, uh, I was studying uh, like political science. Maxwell, yeah. I, I did a dual yeah. degree in uh, journalism and political science. Uh, and I was there in the 1960s. It was 66 I started and graduated in 70 and then 72 with a master. It was an amazing moment in American life uh, of dynamism and social movements and civil rights and Vietnam War. Just so many things were going on. Uh, but I've been back in the Middle East since 1972 or so. Uh, so I've been, I've had about 45 years, all of it in journalism, uh, writing, reporting, observing, and most of it for, uh, in English language, for people in the Western world, Europe, the US. Um, and it's just been a tremendous uh, career that I've had and I'm grateful for it and I've learned a lot and I'm always happy to share what I've, what I've learned. Um, one of the things I've learned, um, and this goes to your paper, uh, the intervention topic, one of the things I've learned is that the, probably the single most important riddle we need to resolve is how do international or foreign organ institutions or organizations like governments, uh, political parties, uh, non-government organizations, private sector, universities, uh, faith-based groups, UN, you know, all of these international kinds of groups, institutions, organizations, how do they engage in our societies, in the Arab world? In a way, and I use the word engage, intervene is another word, how do they intervene, how do they, how do, how do they I use engage because it's in kind of neutral term. How do international organizations and powers engage in our society? In a manner that is uh, useful and at the same time, uh, realistic and, and legitimate. So the, the single greatest piece of advice I could give you in your careers, whatever you end up doing, in the military or in other areas, if you're thinking about doing something in, in the Middle East, especially if it's military action, which the US has been involved in military action for the last 25 years, nonstop, in the, uh, in the Middle East, in Afghanistan, Iraq and other places, and now with the drones, and other than having your normal bases and bilateral stuff, but an actual active military combat. It's been a quarter of a century. And things are getting worse, they're not getting better. Not, it's not your fault, it's because of the situation out there. But to be involved militarily in a situation in conditions like we have in Yemen, Iraq, or Syria, uh, is a very complicated thing. So my best advice to you is, before you think of getting involved 
in any manner, military, economic aid, training uh, people in democracy, <coughs> training uh, women in electoral politics, whatever it is, you have to really ask three, three questions. Uh, and if you can't answer these questions, you shouldn't do anything. You should not get involved. But the first question is about legitimacy. Is what you're doing legitimate? And legitimacy has two uh, uh, criteria. Legitimacy in the eyes of the international community. And there you have things like international law, conventions, <coughs> international humanitarian law, UN resolutions. There's all kinds of uh, norms for what is considered a legitimate intervention or engagement. So when the NATO went into Libya, that was considered legitimate. Uh, when the US and Britain went into Iraq in 2003, most people thought it was not legitimate because it wasn't sanctioned by the UN. Uh, so legitimacy has the international dimension, but it also, which includes your domestic uh, uh, public opinion and your own uh, country's laws, but the other more important part of legitimacy, I think, is legitimacy in the eyes of the people that you're engaging with. And, and that's hard to, to gauge, but you've got to answer the legitimacy question. Is what you're doing legitimate? Does it seem to be fair, reasonable, <coughs> appropriate, etc.? The second uh, question you need to ask is what means are you using? Are you using the best means? Uh, is military action, economic action, sanctions, political action at the UN, a people to people, absolutely legitimate thing to do. Uh, everybody, I think, agrees we need to fight and defeat Daesh, more importantly, defeat the underlying political, social, and economic issues that gave rise to Daesh, like they gave rise to Al-Qaeda 25 years ago. Uh, so that's, fighting Daesh is, uh, is legitimate, but now the question is, does the U.S. send more military <coughs> people, or does it do other things like train Iraqis and Kurds and Arabs and, uh, and others, and Turks or whatever? Uh, uh, so the means that you use uh, is sending Apache helicopters the most effective means to achieve the end you want to achieve, or is there a better way to do it, maybe engage, try to create a real coalition, not the fuddy duddy one that exists now, but the one that exists now isn't really a coalition. It's the Americans, the Saudis a bit, and one or two other people, um, uh, and it's not really a, a coalition. Um, so the means are important. And the third thing, which is very difficult, but very important, is the consequences. Can you gauge the consequences, the fallout, the after effect, of your intervention? Um, and you absolutely really must answer those three questions. If you have, I don't know, for one of those uh, three questions, you should not do anything until you figure out what's the answer. If you can answer those three questions in a positive way, then you go ahead and engage, whatever it is you want to do, military, political, economic, whatever. Um, and I say this because the, the track record of foreign intervention in our region, I'm talking about the Arab world, but, because it's really the Arab world where the problems are. You know, Israel, Turkey, uh, Iran are not really societies in, in deep internal trouble. Uh, people have complaints against all three of them. I have a lot of complaints as a Palestinian. I have a lot of complaints about Israeli policies. A lot of people complain about Iran. I have certainly some complaints about Iran. I think most of the accusations against them are exaggerated or unsubstantiated but they're genuine and they're legitimate. And so, and Turkey, people have good and bad things to say about it. And, uh, so, but the real problems are in the Arab countries. That's where the real tensions are, the wars, the violence, the, the barbaric actions like Daesh, the, uh, the attacks against the United States in 9-11. Most of these came out of the Arab world, and that's where the problems are. And most of the modern history of Western military engagement in Arab countries and Western political engagement in Arab countries has been problematic in my view. It's not created positive results. There are some cases where it did, but by and large it's, it hasn't been uh, very positive. And you see the consequences uh, with, if you look at Arab public opinion, which now we know because there's 
all kinds of great surveys that are being done every year now. If you're interested in Arab public opinion, go to the, um, the this institute in Doha, Qatar, called the Doha, Doha uh, Institute. Uh, its full name is the Arab Center for Policy Research, uh, but it's called the Doha Institute. It's a very serious Arab-run, Qatari-funded think tank, which is now creating a master's program. And they're very, very serious people. They do an annual survey of the whole Arab world. They, they survey like 30, 40,000 people to have, you know, represented. So that's the best, and it's very professionally done. It's not propagandistic. They, they ask tough questions, and if you're interested in insights into public opinion in the Arab world, go to the website. They do this every year, and they, uh, <coughs> and there's many other surveys done by Gallup, and, and Zogby and American groups too. So we know we know now very clearly what Arab public opinion feels, which we didn't know 20 years ago because there was surveys were not done, polls were not allowed. But we know that now, so there's no excuse, excuse for us to say that well we, we weren't sure what Arab people thought. But now we know, and one of the things we know is that they they really resent foreign military intervention, and they super resent the constant foreign. And I say foreign, not American. I'm saying foreign because it includes the Russians, includes the Iranians, includes the Europeans, includes the Chinese and the Americans. Foreign support for Arab autocratic dictatorial regimes. That is, that is probably the single biggest gripe that people in the Arab world have against the US and England and, and, and Russia back in the days when the Soviet Union the Cold War, the Soviets supported some Arab autocrats like Syria, Iraq, and others, and, and the West supported other Arab autocrats like Jordan, Morocco, and Saudi Arabia. Um, and, and so the, your actions as a country, political or um, military, have serious consequences. And some of the consequences we're seeing in their worst form include the birth and growth of the Qaeda and uh, and uh, and ISIS and clash. So legitimacy, means, and consequences of any engagement in not just the Arab world, but anywhere in the world, is something you really need to give a lot of thought to. And if your commanding officers or your political masters in Washington are making decisions which you think are not based on these things being assessed ahead of time, I know you can't call them up and you, know, you can't call the president and say, hey, Mr. President, you, you're making a hasty decision. That's not allowed, first of all. Um, but I think you, as American citizens and as servicemen and women, you want to try to use the means available to you within your institutions <coughs> raising these questions. You say, are we doing the right thing? It's fascinating. Uh, I've been doing lectures and teaching and stuff in the US since the, since the 70s. And it's only in the last, like, seven, eight years that I have been uh, getting a strong stream of questioning, questions after my talks about. And the theme that is so strong now is people in the U.S. say, well, what should we do? Because before they would be, more well, Americans, whether they're officials or students or people in the media, whatever, they were much more confident that they were doing the right thing. Now there's a lot less uh, certitude in the U.S. Uh, about whether the U.S. is doing the right thing. I think the, the experience of all these wars uh, and the situation getting worse has impacted. So I think people are more humble, they're more realistic, and they're asking, you know, what should we do? Are we doing the right thing? Is there anything else we can do? This massive refugee flow has triggered huge uh, t uh, studies to figure out what is the best thing to do in terms of immediate humanitarian action, as well as in longer term political action or social economic action to stem the flow in the future. Uh, and I think that's very helpful. That's very positive. Uh, so I'll just stop there because there's so many uh, different things to act. Now, let me give you just one more general point, which cuts across the board. Mm -hmm. And then we can get to your questions and discussions. The, the, the biggest mistake that foreign people, governments, analysts make. The biggest mistake they make in looking at our region, analyzing it, and responding to it in whatever they do, 
is to confuse religion with politics. There's an overwhelming overemphasis and exaggeration of the religious dimension of life in our societies and people's attitudes and people's actions in our societies. Now, this is totally understandable uh, because of 9-11, mainly. I, I was in Boston when 9-11 happened. Um, I was trash talking the Red Sox because I'm a Yankee. I was, I was born in New York. So, uh, I was there at Harvard that year and, and watched the reaction in the U.S. when 9-11 happened. And it was just an extraordinary experience to see how Americans, uh, people, and, and government uh, reacted with, with good and, and, and bad things. But we, we don't have time to go into that. But the biggest mistake that has been made since then has been to vastly overemphasize and, and blow out of proportion the role of religion. Um, it's true that terrorists, you know, will yell Allah <coughs> for blowing themselves up. Um, but they're not blowing themselves up for religious reasons. They're, they're committing terrorist acts for political reasons, or national reasons, or some other series of factors of resentments, of fears, of vulnerabilities, of anger. Uh, and it's critical to cut through that superficial focus on religion, especially Islam, um, and to really understand what is the driving force behind uh, terrorist action, behind mass public opinion, negative um, perceptions of, say, American foreign policy or British foreign policy. Um, why is it that the only mass movements in the, in the Arab world, and probably the wider uh, Muslim, Arab Muslim Middle East, like Turkey and Iran, why is it that the only movements that have an Islamic color to them are successful as mass movements? Um, it's important to understand. So there's a huge role that religion plays in people's lives. But religion does not drive political actions, necessarily. It's a, it's a complex uh, issue, and, and Joanne can help you uh, work through it in the third semester. But I would just leave you with that thought. Uh, so, so you know the expression, Allah Akbar, God is great. Well, when Martin Luther King was giving his famous speech on the steps of the, in Washington, was it the Lincoln Memorial, the steps, and he said, free at last, free at last. Well, what he said was, free at last, free at last, Allahu Akbar will free at last. God is free. That's what he said, God Almighty. So, when, if you think about that, why was a civil rights leader uh, constantly referring to God? And, he, and if you go back and read civil rights stuff, um, it's all about the book of Isaiah, Deuteronomy, and Moses, and the mountain <coughs> and the Almighty, and whatever. Uh, because people who have no option to bring about change in societies where they are suppressed and subjugated and mistreated, if they have no option to bring about a better life for them and their kids through the normal political system, which is the case in our region, they will have basically three options. One is to turn to religion to protect themselves, because God is their last refuge. The second is to immigrate, the, which many do, but that's why there's hundreds of thousands of bright young Arabs, including my children, who are left there, but there's no future for them. Join, uh, uh, join uh, a terrorist groups, but the vast majority don't. The vast majority <coughs> follow Muslim Islamist political groups like the Muslim Brotherhood or Salafi movements or others who are not violent for the most part. Uh, so it's really important to understand what is religion and what is politics, uh, and, and separate those two things. So, you, so, so when you make your analysis about are you going to engage with the country in some manner, or make sure that you're engaging based on an accurate understanding of what is the actual reality in that country, what are the public sentiments, and, and uh, that's linked to the, another issue, which is you can't only deal with government views. You have to be aware of public opinion. Um, because government views in most Arab countries do not reflect public opinion. Uh, and that's a whole separate story. Uh, anyway, I'll stop there. 
and just to give you some things to think about. And I'm looking forward to your questions or comments or uh, uh, anything you want me to talk more about. Uh, but I'd love to hear your your questions. So why don't we go around the other way this time? Is that all right? Or sure. Do you have a no, I, I, I reverse my circle order periodically. Let's start with Brianna. <laughs> No passes this time. Put <laughs> me on the spot. Um, <coughs> yes. So I know you brought up the topic that I want to talk about in my research paper. Um, what is your personal opinion on intervention? What is my what? Personal opinion. Personal opinion. Well, it's what I said. If it's legitimate and the means are appropriate and the consequences are reasonable, then intervention can be approved. I mean, I'm not saying we should never interfere, intervene, intervene, intervene or interfere or engage. <coughs> uh, there are legitimate situations where foreign powers have to get involved, even militarily, absolutely, there's no question about it. But they cannot lead the process unilaterally. You can't, so what, what the U.S. has done recently uh, with Daesh, you know, Kerry said, we're going to lead this great coalition and be big fanfare and had 52 countries. And, and it was it was all smoke and mirrors. It was basically three or four countries. And it's basically the American military, it's basically the Air Force, you guys. Um, you guys and the guys. Um, <coughs> these guys accepted as unisex these days? You folks. You folks. <laughs> you folks. Uh, the Air Force is the primary instrument now being used, drones and uh, the Air Force, drones were run by the Air Force, or, mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, uh, and the uh, aerial attacks. Uh, um. <coughs> so, if the U.S. initiates and leads a process without sufficient legitimacy, it's probably not going to have the desired consequences. Um, and we saw this with, we saw it with damage. When, I mean, the biggest problem is that the countries in the region did not fight damage. Actually, the biggest, biggest problem is that the countries in the region, mostly the Arab countries, created such awful conditions for their citizens that groups like Daesh and Qaeda were actually, uh, were, came into being, came out of our societies. They didn't come from Mexico and Vietnam. These are, you know, products of our, our problems, our bad policies, our poor conditions, the abuse of our citizens by our own governments. There's other uh, problems with Israeli colonization and occupation and Western militarism, but the biggest problem is domestic indignity in Arab societies because of autocratic political systems and poor socioeconomic trends that led to a situation by 2010 where probably two-thirds of the Arab people were living just around the poverty line or below it, but more importantly had no sense of possibility of improving their life. And that's why these uprisings broke out in 2010-2011. People just completely lost hope of ever having a normal life, especially for their kids, jobs, schooling, etc. Uh, and then they, uh, they uh, uh, erupted. Uh, so the conditions in the Arab world are the biggest problems, biggest causes of the problems we have today. They led to the birth of Al-Qaeda 25 years ago, and now Daesh. Massive Muslim Brotherhood movements which were predominantly peaceful, nothing wrong with them. Um, and um, clearly there was a problem in our, uh, in our society. But the added problem of Western military action seen, uh, and, and these societies did not themselves, these governments were unable or unwilling uh, to fight Daesh themselves. I mean, it's astounding to me that we didn't get the Saudis, the Jordanians, the Iranians, the Iraqis, Syrians, and Turks, the ones right around it, together creating a military force, ground and air and missiles and everything, to, to push back Daesh a year ago when it would just came into being. It would have been very easy back then, but they didn't. And that's because they're incompetent, or they're illegitimate, or they're corrupt, or whatever, or they're chicken. Or, there's many reasons why the, the Arab and other countries did not do it. So therefore, the U.S. took the lead, which is, you know, noble and heroic at one level, but it hasn't worked. It's, they've been doing it for a year, and Daesh is still there and keeps expanding 
little bits here and there, and they're setting up little franchises and different things. There's still a very small movement. Daesh is not an existential threat to the U.S. It's an irritant, threat, but it's a threat to the, the Arab countries more than it is to the U.S. Um, so uh, intervening should not be a process that the U.S. leads unilaterally, and the U.S. should be engaged, like it was in Libya, which was more legitimate, in a consortium of international groups um, that has legitimacy in the eyes of the people in the region where the intervention is taking place. So that, that's my view of uh, intervention. If the Arab countries were better run, more democratic, more stable, there'd be less need for intervention. We wouldn't have uh, all, these, uh, all these problems that create the need for drastic last minute intervention. Mm -hmm. Since we're not going to get to everybody's question, Brianna, thank you for starting us off. Who wants to ask a question? We'll go with that. Sage and then table. Okay. Just kind of going off what you were saying there too, adding a little bit to it. Going, moving past the legitimacy part to the means part, it seems like the United States goes in with a really kinetic standpoint to war. Especially, I mean, we have pretty strong military. I think the natural reaction is to take our weapons and do a lot of air raids and do a lot of strikes. Do you believe that we should be moving more to a war on information? And if so, how do we make that transition with such a strong military presence? I mean, how do we, uh, I don't know, get more involvement maybe from organizations beyond the military to uh, get more involved in the information side of the war? Like we've seen with Daesh with the uh, social media, for example, and move past just the, the first idea, because like you said, maybe it's not working at the moment uh, to maybe attack these issues from a less kinetic standpoint? I think so. I, I wouldn't necessarily jump from the kinetic to the information. I think the information, focus, social media, and all these things are, again, vastly exaggerated. Um, I, I, give, I give the analogy that social media is to the uh, Arab world, whether it's positive or negative, whether it's the social media in the Arab uprisings of Tunis and Egypt and all that, uh, where people were in the West were saying this is Facebook revolution, Twitter revolution, so it was exaggerated. Or social revolution that, uh, or the social media that Daesh uses in the car, that uh, were used for good or for bad. I give the analogy that social media to Arab issues, <coughs> Paul Revere's horse to the American Revolution. <laughs> Paul Revere's horse was a means that was allowed a communication process to have, a very important communication process. But it wasn't Paul Revere's horse that was important, it was Paul Revere. It's the person, the people, who use social media. Their mindset, their condition, their receptivity to social media messaging, whether for good or for bad, to make a democratic uprising or to join a terrorist group. Um, social media is just a means, just like a horse. You can do good things with it, you can do bad things with it. Paul Revere did good things with his horse. The Egyptian... Uh, Barat, during the uprising in Tahrir Square, rode in with horses one day and trampled people. They did bad things with horses. So you can do what to them. So yes, you need to go think beyond kinetic means uh, whenever you can. Uh, and the real challenge, the tough, tough issue, is really preventive, uh, preemptive and preventive. So, we have these conditions in our countries, no political rights, no civil, well, civil rights are mixed. <coughs> Individual citizens just don't have the same rights as they have here in the United States. They can't re question their government. They don't hold it accountable. The king of Saudi Arabia decides he's going to spend 60 or 80 billion dollars to, you know, give money to buy off his people so they don't have an uprising, and he just makes that decision. The Emir of Kuwait does the same thing. The, the, and the, these amazing decisions of spending billions and billions of dollars are made by one person. Uh, Bashar al-Assad, Saddam Hussein, before. These guys could do anything they want, and nobody could question them. There's no accountability, uh, no pluralism. So that's those conditions with the economic <coughs> stress that we've had in the last 30 years, leading to mass uh, you know, pauperization or close to pauperization and poverty. Those are the conditions that need to be changed. And that's not an easy thing to do. It takes a long time to turn around a situation of, of, of uh, autocratic, 
corrupt government to turn it around into a better run government system that gives people a chance to live a decent life. That's what will prevent the future need for military intervention. That is very difficult, but it's something that people have done all over the world. If you look at Malaysia, you look at Indonesia, you look at Chile, you look at um, Northern Ireland, uh, South Africa, there's many places around the world that were, you know, were Turkey, that were dictatorships, that were badly run, uh, there was great social stress, and they transformed over the last 30, 40 years into good democracies, uh, growing economic uh, sectors, and a growing middle class, and, and, a, and a better life for everybody. So, so how does the U.S. get involved in that kind of process? It's very difficult, but it's really imperative. And the U.S. should tell people in the Arab countries and everywhere in the world, it shouldn't go in there and say, look, we're going to come and help you have a better legal system. They've tried programs and things. Um, most of these things don't work uh, once the money stops coming from the U.S. Um, but what you need to do, I think, is find out how can you respond to initiatives already taken in these countries where people themselves decide they want to fix up their judiciary or free press or controls on, on police or whatever, and then help them, but not you initiate uh, the process. It's a huge challenge. Um, and it goes back to what I said in the beginning, that how do you intervene, how do you engage uh, in countries? You, I think you should specify, spell out, these are our values as Americans. This is what we support. And we will help anybody in the world who is creating an independent and professional judiciary, free media, human rights uh, protections. You spell these out that, that you will help anybody who do this. And, and if, if one country starts to do this, then they come to you and, and you give them 100 million bucks, they look, you know, definitely want to help you. But they initiate it. And then it has more legitimacy, it has more efficacy, more credibility. And, and you're not seen as bossing them around and telling them you need to do this and you need uh, to do this. And they'll tell you, by the way, they say, oh, by the way, can you please help us resolve the Arab Israeli question and be a little bit more equitable and fair as a mediator? Uh, because if you help us resolve the Arab-Israeli question, you're addressing the biggest single source of radicalism and frustration and anger in the Middle East. So, uh, again, the, the, there's a lot of things that are linked together, economic and social issues, political issues, military intervention, Arab-Israeli stuff, the role of Iran. There's a lot of different things happening, and they all have linkages. Uh, but you, you can't address them all together. You, can, you have to address them one by one. Uh, but you have to keep in mind that people in Arab countries are interested in having more democratic systems, better growing economies, but they're also concerned about Palestinians, they're also concerned about Iran, they're concerned about uh, other, uh, other issues. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, mine's sort of similar to that. Uh, it's, it's a little similar to that question, but it's um, a little bit, I guess, going down a different route. Um, when you were talking about your, 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 like you have a theme that a lot of people are asking you, like what more can the United States do, or, you know, or what should the U.S. do, or what should are we United doing States the right do? thing? Are we doing the right thing? Um, my question is more like, are we doing too much? Um, in, se in the sense that, essentially, like when we, I mean, I know we've been involved. The United States as a country have been involved in the Middle East for several years prior to September 11. Um, I feel like the dynamic shifted a lot after we were. Uh, attacked on our home territory, and now that we've kind of been engaged in several different conflicts in the Middle East, that the American people are kind of unsure of like the military's mission and what, what, why we're still there. So I'm just wondering, is it necessarily justified, or like what's the not the way out, but are we, you know, like do you understand like kind of what I'm getting at, sir, in yeah. terms of like are we justified in kind of the missions that we're running right now, or? Well, I, I would say, yeah, I would say in general, I think the critical first step we need to do in this process, I gave you those three criteria. You have to do an honest, complete analysis. Of, and I'm sure they teach you this in whatever you're doing, military operation, or an academic <coughs> operation, or research, or anything. You study the situation really honestly. I wrote a column, do you have a column about the snake oil merchants? I read it. I did uh, not send it. Did you read it? I read it, yeah. yeah. Yay for you. <laughs> I was at an event last week in, in Washington with 
I won't mention the name just out of courtesy. It's on the website. But I was with former American Secretaries of State, a former White House National Security Advisor, very senior people. And they were looking to study how can the U.S. and the Arabs work together better to have a better world. Because they realize there's a mess out there, and it's bad for the U.S., it's bad for them. And so they launched this big study, and now another institution, <coughs> the Carnegie Endowment, has launched a big Arab world project, multi-year, to study the conditions in the Arab world. So I wrote this column, which I hope you, it's on my website. By the way, if you ever want to read my stuff, just go to my name, ramifuli.com. It's the website of the syndication agency in the U.S. that syndicates my columns. And you can read them for free, obviously. Um, um, but I wrote this column, and what I, they invited me to this meeting in Washington, it was a public event, to give my comments about their initial report about what, what the U.S. can do to work with the Arabs better for mutual well-being and everything. And I said very simply, do an honest, complete analysis, which is not done now. Because what the, so this first step is to study what's the problem. Why are there all these wars? Why are people chopping heads off? Why are they criticizing the US and, and others? And one of the, the main reason I told you is that our own domestic autocracy and, and problems, etc., and mismanagement, tyranny, and whatever. But there's two other factors that have to be assessed, and which are not. The impact of the Arab Israeli conflict, which includes the role of the US supporting Israel overwhelmingly. And, and that's demonstrated by the fact that last year in the Gaza war, the U.S. Senate voted 100 to nothing to support Israel. Now, that's a perfectly legitimate position that any country can take. But the U.S. Senate has never voted 100 to nothing on anything, even supporting the... They didn't vote 100 to nothing to fight Al-Qaeda. Uh, I think that there was a few senators, famous people who voted against going to Afghanistan and Iraq and stuff. So there's a huge tilt in American... Uh, policies on Arab Israeli in favor of Israel, which is, a, and this has implications. So that has to be factored in. And the other one is the intervention by Western American and other military forces in the Arab world. Those two things, American militarism or Western militarism and Arab Israeli impact on our region, have to be calculated into any analysis. And they're not right now. So I wrote this column saying, are, are, are these attempts in the US are these like snake oil salesmen who are just selling us you know, cheap, uh, false bill of goods? Or are these examples of the best, most honest, most uh, most impressive American traditions of honesty and courage and, 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 and looking at a problem like an engineer does to study all the elements and then come up with a technical solution? So the answer is to you have to do an honest, complete analysis. If you leave out American, the impact of the American uh, uh, interventions. For instance, the, the impact of the Iraq war. It's been catastrophic across the region. It created the environment for Daesh to come into being. It didn't create Daesh, but it provided the environment of chaos and ungovernability that Daesh used. So you have to study <coughs> these things honestly. And Americans haven't done that, by and large. The American government. And, um, so that's really the starting point to do an honest analysis. And then if you identify, here are the four major underlying reasons for this problem situation over there. Then you can say, here's what we can do about it. Uh, and again, the long-term antidote is more democracy, more equity in social development, more economic opportunity. That takes time, but it, it's, it can be done. It's been done all over the world. Uh, it's, you know, economic and social development is easy if you have a good government. Creating a good government is the big, is the big uh, challenge. So I think the U.S. in its response to 9-11 has exaggerated the role of religion and religiosity in our region, underplayed the role of political sentiments among people in our region, and woefully exaggerated the uh, counterterrorism approach to solving what is essentially a political problem rather than a terror problem. Terror is a symptom of underlying political sicknesses, ail ailments. Um, Counterterrorism is absolutely important to protect yourself from terror. Most of the terror is against people in the Middle East, and the US is actually rarely uh, attacked. And when it is attacked, it becomes huge news because it's something unusual for you to have somebody do it, whether it's 9-11 or Benghazi, or something like that. 
Uh, it happens now and then, but it's really quite rare. And you're pretty good at, at you've protected yourselves now. You've got all these you know, things in place. But the emphasis on counterterrorism uh, has been, I think, very exaggerated and needs to be recalibrated to keep doing counterterrorism, but <coughs> pay much more attention to political and social and economic uh, factors. And the best thing to do in this regard is to engage with people in the Arab world at your levels, uh, as, as university students, government officials, think tanks, whatever, media, spend time talking to people over there, like sitting like this and discussing, say, what's the problem? You know, what, 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 what's the problem? What can we both do about it? Uh, rather than having people in Washington decide, okay, here's the problem, we're going to hit them with this, or we're going to do this. Uh, so it, it, it needs, there, is, there needs to be some re-analysis of uh, the be most appropriate American response. We have three, four minutes left. Who has a quick <laughs> okay. I have a great follow-up question. So you're saying um, like the American government needs to um, kind of acknowledge like how we, like what consequences we have caused in the Middle East. Um, so Does like, the U.S. government have knowledge? No, no. The U.S. the U.S. government like refuses to acknowledge its responsibility. Well, I think anybody should acknowledge yeah. what they've done. Uh, you know, the other day, Tony Blair, this, this sort of criminal, I, I, I hate him, he's terrible, the former British Prime Minister, for many things. Uh, but he uh, he publicly, in a CNN interview, said, I'm sorry this happened. Or, so he sort of acknowledged it. But yes, I think people should acknowledge if they've made a mistake. And it's the American way. And if this is what the U.S., this is what makes the U.S. so special. People are held responsible. People are accountable for their actions. You're accountable to the rule of law. And you're accountable to basic human decency, to treat people well and, and be treated well by them. So yes, I think people should acknowledge if they if they made a mistake or they went too far in one way uh, or another. You know, the, the single I used to write books on archaeology and religion and stuff, and so as well as politics. And one of the things I learned, especially from uh, religious uh, uh, writing studies, that. Uh, uh, is the, the most important uh, factor, I think, that people should invoke, uh, the most important attribute that people should have in their lives and their professional lives in, in addressing issues like this is humility. Uh, and it's a big thing in the, if you look in the Bible, the Hebrew Bible and, and the Christian and New Testament and the Quran, but humility is, is huge. And not just humility before God, but humility before other human beings. So people should be humble realize that they can make mistakes uh, and not be afraid to assess what they've done and not to be afraid to talk to other people and just together discuss are we doing the right thing, can we do this better, what's the most <coughs> appropriate way that we can work together to fix this, uh, this problem. We need more humility. Uh, I think there is more humility now in the White House than there was in the previous administration. Um, and, and you know, the response to 9-11 was I thought exaggerated in terms of the military counter-terror response, but it was completely understandable. I mean, I, I saw the shock that happened here when people, when the U.S. was attacked, and it was traumatic. It was a criminal, traumatic uh, attack. Uh, and people responded in a human, normal human way, but they did not respond according to the best principles of American democratic, which is to be much more thoughtful, to study things, to have a consensus, to have a debate, and then come up with a good policy. Uh, and I think this is where you need to draw on your best traditions. Uh, how did you address the civil rights issues, the mistreatment of Native Americans, the, the environmental issues, you, immigration now, there's incredible studies, debate, discussion on these big <coughs> issues, and you then come up with a policy, a consensus that everybody agrees on. That's the, that's the best of America as far as as I can tell, and that's, I think, what people need to uh, work on. And we're going to have to wrap it up, because some of them have classes they're going to, but let's thank Ronnie for being here.